Ladies and gentlemen, very disturbing things are currently happening in the chess world. By the way, I got a new sweater. Do you like it? Nice and shiny. Looks pretty cool. Let me know in the comments. Disturbing things are happening in the chess world as Magnus Carlsen, the greatest of our generation and maybe of all time, is struggling at the Tata Steel chess tournament currently going on in the Netherlands. And we are patiently awaiting to see if we are going to experience a comeback. This is yet another recap video coming out of Tata Steel. This one is round number six. Uh, and I'm going to offer you the same trade that I offered you in yesterday's recap. And that was that if I show you the Magnus Carlsen game first, and I don't waste your time in today's video, which is exactly what I did yesterday, that you, in turn, will check out the absolutely free sample of my Middle Games Masterclass and... Don't listen to me, listen to him. You will notice chapter four, making a plan is available to you 100% free. You can see, he said it, I'm saying it, everybody's saying it. You, you can listen to that levy, you can listen to this levy, whatever you wanna do, just go ahead and click get free chapter. Listen, yesterday's video got like a million views in 24 hours, which is insane by the way. And only like, I mean like 15,000 of you signed up, which percentage wise is, I mean, that's an amazing amount of people, but Percentage-wise, folks, y'all don't like free things. What do I got to do to incentivize you? Do I got to tell you, like, free free cats, free hats, free cars? What, what do you even like? Anyway, let's start today's recap. So here's Magnus. He's playing against Jordan Van Forest. Now, the interesting thing about this is that for his last World Championship match, Magnus worked with Jordan. So Magnus knows a little bit about Jordan. Uh, and Magnus goes for a Sicilian defense. Jordan has been playing very aggressive chess throughout uh, this event. Probably too aggressive. He plays knight f3. Magnus plays e6. Magnus, for like six or seven years, was really just busting out this all the time. Uh, but now he plays e6, so he's clearly looking to play a Taimanov, and play a Taimanov he does. Now, the main line here by white is to play bishop 2e3, f3, queen d2, long castle, g4, and blah, 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 blah. Another line which has gotten pretty popular pretty recently is to play bishop to e3 and then queen f3. So knight f6, and then I don't, ex I, th I believe this, th this is the idea. It's a very, very aggressive and complex line. There's also various lines where white plays this and then takes, then puts the queen here. Jordan plays knight c6, which is a very unpopular move. And then in this position, after setting up the cannon, he plays the move queen d4. Queen d4 is a weird move. I don't understand it. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure the idea is to prevent the movement of the bishop. Like, it's difficult for black to develop. For instance, if black plays the very natural looking knight to f6, black simply just loses because of e5. Knight d5, I can take, I can castle long, and I mean, you know, Ma Magnus is not gonna do this. Uh, rest assured, doubled pawns and so on, long castles coming. So Magnus plays queen d6, offering a queen trade, and then Jordan uh, offers him a bishop trade as well. Now, it may look like Jordan is just trying to trade all the pieces and make it so that, you know, Magnus gets bored and takes too much of a risk. That could be it. Um, it could be looking like he's just trying to bore Magnus to death and, you know, he's just trying to make a draw. I don't think any of that really is true. I mean, I think Jordan is trying to play the best moves. But, you know, again, around here, I was like, oh, Magnus is, you know, Mag he here we go, right? Here we go again. Uh, Magnus is volunteering to damage his own e-pawns, so he can grip the dark square, so the bishop can stare into the structure, which normally is bad, but in this case, you know, black might soften up these pawns. And we're just gonna see Magnus do his thing and go to work. Now, Jordan plays king b1. We have a4, b4. And, you know, Ma again, Magnus, there we go. He's suddenly taking over the game. Now he's got d5 and g4 and h5, and I'm like, all right, well, here we go. Here's the, here's the Magnesian school of chess. Jordan plays c3, Magnus takes, and uh, plays the move d5. We have pawn takes d5, and we have a rooks and bishop endgame. Now, black had another option here, which was to take with the pawn and try to create a passer, but that's silly. It's silly because you kill your own bishop. Magnus isn't into killing his own bishop. And Jordan tries to trade the bishops here. Why does he try to trade the bishops? Because it's actually very difficult for white to do anything. You cannot attack this. You're not going to be able to attack any of that. And this bishop is super strong. I mean, Jordan just thinks that his bishop is of a lower quality. So he goes to trade it. And then here, Jordan plays this very interesting idea before. Um, he gives away a pawn, but he niftily slides... Is that a word? Niftily? He slides the bishop back here, and he's going to win b4 back. And we get this endgame. 
So both sides have four pawns. If Jordan's pawn was here, this would just be over, but it's not. It's a flank pawn, and actually it could become a queen. I mean, maybe, right? So I'm like, oh my god. Now at this point, I started seeing tweets like, when's the last time Magnus lost three games in a row in a tournament? I was like, are you, what? This is the level of disrespect we are showing the world champion? I mean, yes, yesterday I made the video called The End of Magnus Carlsen, question mark, and he was literally disintegrating in the thumbnail, but that was for dramatic effect, and, you know, I wanted to get a million views in 24 hours, and it seems to have worked, and I think you guys enjoyed the recap, but preemptively saying he's going to lose? I mean, really? So, Rook C2, and again, this whole time, I'm like, I believe in Magnus, I mean, he's gonna stop this pawn and walk his king in and win all these pawns, but, uh, I, I, you know what, I gotta give Jordan some credit. Rook C7, he was holding serve, he got it down to a rook end game, and Magnus did everything. I mean, he did everything he wanted in this position. He got in. He got in. But Jordan used that A pawn to freeze the rook. The rook now has to stay either on the A file or on the eighth rank. And here comes the king. You could lose all these pawns. But Jordan was quick with the counterplay. Now Magnus sacrificed the pawn to shield his king and start pushing, but Jordan's king is walking up the board. Both pawns. Now, now it's just a free for all, it's a huge race. Two pass pawns for white, one major one for black, and one very far away, but there's just no way. If you promote, I take, and then I make my own queen. So the game actually just ends in a perpetual check from moves uh, 50 to 54. Uh, the reason it ended like this is black has to stay monitoring this, and if given too many checks, white really shouldn't be running over here because you'll probably just lose this pawn. So, Magnus avoids three losses in a row. Uh, a solid performance from both guys. I mean, sometimes you, they both just play a very high-level game of chess. But I'm still awaiting the comeback. Hence why I put it here. Do you like my sweater, by the way? I'm, I don't know why I asked you that a second time. I like it a lot. Um, sometimes I like to, you know, share things with you. You know the feeling. New clothes. Smells nice. Um, anyway, a draw for Magnus. Now, you're probably thinking, Levy, that was really boring. I'm not going to go check out that free sample. No, seriously. Really, you, you, if, if you want to gain, like, 300 rating points, results may vary. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, as always, folks, the rest of this recap is going to have super exciting chess. Uh, you're welcome to leave if all you care about is Magnus. Uh, you're welcome to not leave if you're not a scumbag. So, you know, look within yourself. All the cool kids hang out until the recap's over. They get a little update. And if you want to go check the standings, there is a link in the description to that. Although, chess comp servers have been just melting. You know why they've been melting? All-time high usership. More people are signing up right now for chess.com than ever before, literally ever, and playing and, you know, doing the lessons on there, so, um, oh, this is actually the next game that I was going to show you. All right, here we go. D4. Uh, it's Fabiano versus Gukesh. It's me disabling my heater behind me. I don't know if you can hear it, but it hisses, and it's extremely annoying. It's like having a snake in the room. Uh, struggles of, you know, trying to heat your place in New York. And sometimes it just randomly turns on in the middle of a recap. It's very annoying. Uh, Gukesh has had a tough event, and Fabiano is a beast. You know, Fabiano knows how to uh, pose a lot of questions to a young talent like Gukesh. He plays Queen A4 check in this Rogozin. Opening is not important. You don't know anything about it anyway. Nope, I don't really know anything about it anyway. Gukesh here does something really, really odd. Um... So, Fabi has a nice position, but Fabi has two bishops. And what do the bishops want to do? They want the position open for them, so Gukesh opens the position for the dark squared bishop. I was trying to understand, like, obviously he had an idea, he didn't make a blunder, but then he proceeded to sacrifice the f6 pawn completely. And I was looking at this like, is he crazy? Like, whoa. And Fabi just goes h4, because the idea is first I'm going to get your knight, and second I'm going to mate you. And I got a rook coming. I was like, wait a minute, isn't Fabi just completely winning? I mean, this looks hopeless. But Gukesh actually has a point. And he chases the queen out. And all right, Fabi takes, and he's, he's a pawn up, but you know, the, it's not over. I mean, there's no attack, probably. f6, blocking the queen, but the pawn is on all the same color as this, so Fabi just develops, defends his pawn. And look at this move from Fabiano, damn it. Rook h4, I mean, are you kidding me? Defending that, getting into the attack, trying to go down the d-file, oh my goodness. e5 played by black. We have knight e4 attacking the black rook on c5, and now the problem is it's bishop versus knight, and the bishop for white has all of this real estate to work on. Uh, queen d2, rook g4 check, 
And a very nice move, h6, to try to get the rook down to g7. The knight's gotta, gotta come in. And uh, here we have a very nice move played by Fabiano. Fabiano, obviously, a proud owner of the Middle Games Masterclass uh, from Gotham. And in the Middle Games Masterclass, one of our chapters is on pawn play and utilizing pawn moves to free up the rest of your pieces. And that pawn move is c5. c5 is an incredible idea, understanding that the bishop would like to go to the square the pawn was on. If pawn takes pawn, you take the rook. If rook takes pawn, a7 loses a guard and you infiltrate on the seventh rank. And uh, the king can hide. But not only will you get this pawn, you are also coming back for that king with bishop c4 ideas, bishop d3 ideas, bishop d1 and bishop c2 and bishop b3 and bishop f3 and bishop b4 ideas. And um, Fabi moves his king, brings the rook over here, does it this way, and he is up only one pawn still, but black is absolutely shut down. He cannot move anything. And this, also vintage stuff here, uh, rook's on the seventh rank. Absolute devastation, and Gukesh doesn't even want to do it, deal with it anymore. Gukesh could have given a few checks. It wouldn't have helped. King is safe. You can't go rook g2 because bishop c4 is made in a few moves. So, I mean, just a, a scintillating performance here by Fabiano. Very, very nice game. Gukesh has struggled in this event. I believe he's on minus three. I think he has three wins. Sorry, not three wins. Three losses and three draws. He might be on minus two, but you can get the answer to that yourself in the standings. He has had it rough. Rough time. Fabi's played pretty well. Now, this Anish Giri Arginary Geisy game was nuts. And if you're still here, as always, I like to save the best for last. The last game of this video was absolutely insane. So, we have a Queen's Gambit declined. All right, by the way, probably the next course that I will be launching, which is in high demand, is a Queen's Gambit declined repertoire for the black pieces. Um, that's not out yet. It's not even not marketing anything. I'm just telling you that probably it's going to be the A6 Queen's Gambit declined. Very good option against a lot of major responses by white. In this game, though, we get a traditional semi-Slav kind of Miran. We have bishop d3. I think this is Miran. Not Moron. That's me. This is Miran. Takes, takes, b5. And a very sharp line early as the center is just busted open. d5. Now, that may look like a free pawn. It's not. Um, I go e5. And then if you come here... Uh, I go here, and then if you take, I take, and I go here, and you're gonna lose. Not exactly like that fast, but that's sort of the idea. There's also other lines. I think you can also take if you want and play rookie one. It's like very aggressive. Uh, but we have c4, this, and Arjun castles long. Pushes all his pawns and puts the king over there. And actually, Anish got off to an uh, incredible start in this game. He played b3, and I was like, oh my god. Arjun's position is about to disintegrate. Bishop c5, bc4, I was like, yo, 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 that's really dangerous for black. And Anish here played a move that I think is just too deep. You know, like sometimes you think about something and then you gotta go, it's not that deep. Like right now, I'm an idiot and I would just play rook b1 because open file, me like file. Anish plays rook c1. I like this move. I get it. The idea is to play bishop to e4 and then have pressure on the pawn instead. But it just... It just looks weird. The bishop is there, right? I mean, obviously, that he does. He plays bishop e4 in the next move. Um, but Arjun just ignores him. He just plays h6. He just plays h6. He's just like, I'm not going to move. Like, what are you going to do? I mean, if you take on d5, I'm going to have defense, right? Like, Arjun's like, well, you want my pawn. I'm not going to give you the pawn. It's, like, not that complicated. And then here, my man Arjun plays king. Bro, where's your king going? It's wide open. What is... Arjun, why, why king b8? Like, I don't understand some things about chess, okay? For instance, black can play rook f4. Now, I'm not saying I would have played the move rook f4 myself if I was playing in this game. But this looks smart. Put the rook right here. Looks pretty nice. All right? Now the engine is telling me I'm stupid. It's telling me queen d2 and that's a fork. Okay, admittedly I missed that. Fine. Okay. Maybe Arjun's really smart. I don't know about king b8 though. King b8's crazy. King b8 puts the bishop on the same line as this bishop and the same file. But Arjun's playing in the tournament and I'm talking about his game. So probably he knows better than me. He just puts his king on a8. Anish is winning. Anish is winning. He's got to attack this pawn. Rook d... Uh, okay, queen d2. Knight b6. Now I need to get rid of that knight. So let me play a4. Now, 
It also was a possibility here to play something like Rook. See, that's what I'm saying. The Rook's got to go back to B1. So my idea was right. Put me in the tournament. Don't put me in the tournament. I'll lose all my games. It would be really embarrassing. Um, Knight D4 is another idea by White. And he does it this way. And he's almost spoiled for choice. Sometimes you get a position like me. You know, this happens to me all the time. I get positions that are totally winning, uh, except when I get blown off the board. But I have like four choices and I never choose right. Right, and like, and this sort of feels like the position that White has right now. Like, you can do everything right here, and, and, and you still need to win the game. Rook A1, and Anish plays E6, and this is just looking completely hopeless. Completely. Rook, but Rook B4 holding it together! Knight D4 somehow! Arjun is proving in this tournament. He is a ridiculous defender. Here, Arjun, a sophisticated long-term subscriber of the Gotham Chess YouTube channel, plays the move C3, danger levels. My rook is hanging. I don't need to move it. Equal or exceeding danger. You don't need to move a piece if you can find something that's equal or higher in value on your opponent's side of the board to attack. And suddenly, suddenly both knights are hanging. H4 avoids back rank checkmate, but uh, black gets sufficient counterplay. And by the skin of his teeth, rook d8 check is covered because both rooks cover it. And the c pawn defends the rook. Archon Aragaisi defended this game like a wizard. A wizard! Alright, it's ridiculous that Anish Giri did not manage to win this game. And it's just a draw. Um, look at this position. Like, the Black King castled and literally had to walk himself to the corner. Physically. This is weak, this is weak, this is a target. Knight b6 and something like knight d4 here. And even at 4 f5 does not look completely out of, out of the question. What does Black do? Like, if Black plays knight a4 like he did in the game to try to play c3, you play e6, you can play a4, f5, you can just move your king to h1. His pawns are delicate. Anish seemingly did absolutely everything right to win another game. My guy, Aragaisi, played rook to b4 and then used his c pawn as a method of counterplay. Defense is one of the most underappreciated things just all the time. All right? And, um... Just incredible. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh... What a game by him. Awesome game. And I told you if you had the patience to watch, you would be treated to a doozy here at the end. It is an all-Dutch matchup. And uh, Erwin Lamy is on the comeback. He lost a couple of games earlier in the event, but he's won a few games. Max Varmdam always shows up to play. And these two guys give us a very complex opening. This is called the Slow Slav. It's anything but slow, though. Uh, we got Queen B3, Queen C7... Take, takes a very sharp line. Uh, a lot of this is theory. Don't worry about it. B5 and uh, knight a5. And I mean, Max is just already attacking. We have bishop a5, queen a5. And the reason that uh, Erwin gave away the, the bishop for the knight there is that the knight was going to arrive and, you know, just be annoying. Plus, black has, like, no development. So now white plays e4. So this is very aggressive stuff. White is castled. White is like two moves away from getting everybody developed. Black has the bishop, the rook, or the rook, and the king. It's not really, it's not really clear where the king is going to go. Often in these positions, black goes this way. Because if black goes this way, black is a psychopath, right? So bishop e7, queen e3 centralizing, rook c8, knight f4, and there's castles. Here's the problem. When black castles this way, you might not be a psychopath, but you are still going to have to answer for some... You know, some questions in the position, like h4, h5, okay? Now, normally what you want to do when you're about to attack somebody is you want to play e5. You want to close the center, and you want to go here. Here's the problem. Close the center. You help the other guy. And you could play h5, but the other guy is going to play knight a4. And you can take on g6, okay? Other guy is going to get to you first. Okay, you can take his knight. He got a bishop, he got a queen, he got a rook, he got rook c2, king c2, queen a2. It's going to be mate in a few moves. Like by force, rook c8, etc. It's crazy. Queen a2, if king d3, I think he has check here, check, and at least he wins your queen, and probably he wins all the rest of your pieces. So, you want to play e5, so instead he does this. Black plays bishop d6, we have bishop d3, we have takes, takes, and knight d5. And just visually speaking, this position looks fantastic for Max Varmerdam, who plays the move b4. He's about to play knight to c3, which basically wins the game on the spot. For instance, if white plays the move h4 here, knight c3 check. Very common sacrifice of a piece. You would know that from chapter 11 of the Middle Games Masterclass, which is all about sacrificing. Pawn takes. Pawn takes. Rook b8. Queen b4. GG. Okay? 
So to not get hit with that, Erwin plays king a1, Max plays this, now we have h4, now we have b3. I mean, one of the guys is getting mated. This is why this game is ending the recap, okay? a3, no mate for you just yet. Personally, I don't like the move that Max plays here, um, but it's very hard to find something. Like, you have knight c3 with the idea to play knight b5 and sacrifice. That is one idea. Having said that, when you go there, I will take and I will continue my own attack. Max plays a5. Pawn to a5. Um, now Erwin brings the king back to b1 because he's like, ah, I don't want to be pinned anymore. Max plays this and now actually has to answer some questions because his attack has slowed down a little bit. Max chooses not to answer any questions. All right? He's just here so he doesn't get fined like Marshawn Lynch. He just wants to play rook c2, which looks like it should win. Okay? Um, it looks like after pawn takes g6, if you just ignore this, okay, don't take there because then I get in. If you just play rook c2, it looks like you're winning. Okay. You just, it just looks like you're winning here. Why does it look like you're winning? Well, for starters, if I take the rook, bc, I get the rook back, I probably win. If you move your queen, let's say, to g5, I have rook takes b2, king takes b2, where's the next check? Queen d4, it's mate in 5 or mate in three, or mate in four, or whatever. It's mate, in a few moves. So rook c2 must win the game, right? And if pawn takes f7, check. King f7, there's no more checks. Bishop g6, I just take. So rook c2 has to be winning for black. Beautiful game by Max Varmerdam. And that is why, in this position, Erwin Lamy sacrificed the rook. Rook h8 check. And you say, wait. Levy, I have seen that tactic before. And then after king h8, you bring the... Wait, but where's the queen going? What? But you can't bring the queen. And if you play rook h1 check, it's the exact same position. Except white is down a rook. We just had this. I don't understand. What did Erwin find? Rook h8 check. King h8. This man... Erwin Le Ami. He, he should be called Erwin Dub Ami. Okay, why is he L? He's not an L. He's a dub. Dub apostrophe Ami. This man just takes a pawn. Dog, what? He sacrificed a rook and then he just took a pawn. Do you know why? Because now the king's in jail. The king is being mated on the next move by the rook and this doofus pawn and the queen can be captured. But rook h1 is mate. I've never seen something like that. A rook sack and just pawn takes pawn. And the black king is stuck. And if you play g6, queen h6 is mate. And if you play g5, I give you a check. And then I check you with my queen. And you're dead. That is nuts. I told you. Uh, you probably feel nice right now. You probably watched until the end. All right? And you probably get this absolutely beautiful tactic. All right? All those other bozos who left, they're never going to see this. All right, they just saw that boring Magnus draw. Rook takes b2, now you can feel better about all of them. And friendly reminder, do check out the free sample when we're done here, okay? King takes b2, check here. Max tries, but just rook c1. And that pawn on f7 is a massive problem for black because it's a, it's a threat not just of mate, it's a threat of promotion. Now we have queen e1 going to the end game. And uh, Black is still winning, but Erwin could have... I think they both had very low time here. In this position, Erwin could have sacrificed his queen once again. <laughs> and uh, then he would have used that sacrifice to go to c5 and then promote or play queen c8. Uh, instead, he does it this way, but the problem is they both have such low time that mistakes are unavoidable. And ultimately, uh, just bishop c4 and ultimately just an endgame win. King d2 and Erwin uh, trades, plays bishop c6, wins all the pawns. And uh, Max resigns. He resigns because if he captures here, Bishop E2 traps the knight. Which is ridiculous. The knight is just literally trapped. Oh, wow, whoa, 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 whoa. It's trapped like that. Once again, that is why I show you the games, and that is why they play them. Because this man actually found... <laughs> pawn takes pawn is so gross. That was fun. Round six is over. Tata Steel is halfway done. Will we see a Magnus comeback? Will Nodjerbek Abdusaturov win the whole thing? Will Anish Giri be able to uh, get a win and get into first place? I don't know. Who's going to win the challenger section? Find out on the next episode of Tata Steel 2023. Now get out of here and check out the Middle Games Masterclass.